Hello, and welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm, brought to you by FunkinStuff.net. This is the interview show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I'm your host, Scott Goldfein, musicologist and author of Everything is on the One, The First Guide to Funk. If you don't have your copy, get on over to Amazon and pick one up. You'll be glad you did. Whether you're watching or listening on the audio podcast, as always, I thank you for your continued support. Another great episode, or episodes, I should say, because it's turned into quite an epic, talking to Mr. Larry Dunn, keyboard extraordinaire. Larry Dunn helped transform Earth, Wind and Fire into one of the all-time most successful R&B bands. With sales of more than 100 million albums worldwide, including 32 gold and platinum, multi-platinum singles and albums. Earth, Wind and Fire also collected six Grammys out of 13 nominations, four American Music Awards, a star in Hollywood's Walk of Fame, induction to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and Songwriters Hall of Fame, and the Grammy's Lifetime Achievement Award, among many other honors. In addition to playing organ, synthesizer, piano, and clavinet, Dunn served as the band's musical director. As one of the key people behind the scenes, much of the group's musical success can be attributed to him. He also rehearsed Earth, Wind & Fire for live stage performances and wrote many of the musical segues and medleys. He had major creative influence on such classics as Shining Star, Spirit, Be Ever Wonderful, Running, See the Light, Let Me Talk, And Love Goes On, Jupiter, and so many other melodies that continue to live on in the hearts of fans and popular music lovers. Dunn's other production and performance credits include The Emotions, Level 42, Ronnie Laws, George Duke, Lenny White, Foley, Ramsey Lewis, Caldera, Hubert Law, Stanley Turrentine, Dan Reeves, Brian Culbertson, D.D. Bridgewater, Stanley Clark, and Denise Williams. Since 1988, Dunn and his wife Louisa have been involved with production projects, writing music for Japanese television commercials, film, and studio work. He released his first solo album in 1996 called Lover's Silhouette, and 2008 released Into the Journey, which includes involvement of many of the high-profile artists just mentioned. Dunn also continues to perform, maintain a busy schedule. In fact, so busy that it took us months to get this hookup, but uh, we we made it happen. And uh, once I got a hold of him, I wasn't going to let go. So this is a, a lengthy interview, but it's very rewarding. And if you go through the whole journey into the journey, you will uh, see Larry noodling on keyboards later on in his uh, uh, mothership, as it were, and also his lovely wife Louisa joins in. So be sure to stay through the whole duration. You'll be glad you did. Amazing stuff with Mr. Larry Dunn coming right up now. I am truly delighted to welcome to Truth and Rhythm, Mr. Larry Dunn, who from 1972 to 1983 served as a primary keyboardist and musical director for funk, R&B, pop music giants, Earth, Wind, and Fire. Larry, so good to have you join us. How are you? Hey, Scotty. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Very good to hear. Coming to us from... Uh, Southern Los California? Angeles. Los Angeles, California. Yeah, so you're in the, uh, your mothership there, it looks like. Yes, uh, that's what they call it. <laughs> the, the laboratory. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad that we could uh, finally connect. We've been trying for a while, so it's good that our schedule's lined up. Been really looking forward to this, so thank hey, you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> As I've conveyed... Big fan going all the way back, so it's truly an honor and looking very much forward to talking about your uh, great career in history. All the way back? To that, well, as far as Earth, Wind & Fire goes, we'll find out what happened before that. I was going to say, because you're, you're not old enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, Larry, I'd like to uh, start by talking about, you know, where you grew up and how you first got into music. And sort of leading us up to just before connecting with Earth, Wind, and Fire. Well, still working on the growing up part, but uh, I was actually born in uh, Denver, Colorado. And and did you have a musical family, or what was that? Absolutely. Like? You know, my uh, uh, first two years of my life was on a farm in Denver, in Colorado. Uh, my grandparents, Pop, Nan, and Papa were Italian, Calabrese from Calabria. So uh, 
Papa took the uh, boat, I would imagine, and uh, ended up in New York. And then uh, I don't know how, but he immediately migrated to Colorado and uh, started the farm. I think it was him and his brother and then sent for Nana. And uh, the first two years were on the farm with mom, my mom, my dad. My mom was Italian. My father was black. Mom, dad, my older brother, Lonnie. And uh, it was, uh, you know, quite an experience. And they, they were musical. Uh, two years old, we moved to suburbia. And uh, mom and dad bought a house. Man, it was a great neighborhood. Uh, my dad played piano, guitar, and uh, upright bass. And so we had a raggedy upright piano in the uh, in the living room, and I used to beat on that. I was drawn to that like a, a moth to the light. And uh, when I was about, I don't know, maybe four or five, maybe five, uh, he taught me Blueberry Hill by Fast Domino. Mm -hmm. And then we would go to North Denver to hang with the Italians, and they'd have their guitars and they'd play Italian folklore and. Uh, and, uh, you know, my mom would sing around the house, too shy to sing in public, uh, outside hanging the clothes. And so I was always surrounded by great music. Hmm. So when did you uh, first start kind of getting into it seriously? Did you have formal training? Uh, when did you start playing with others? Well, um, like I said, two started beating on it, probably about four or five. I think when I was in... Um, third grade uh like i said our neighborhood was was golden we had all nationalities all types of people um and we all got along i think you and i had talked about it before when we first started speaking about how uh, i don't understand if we're supposed to be so evolved how it seems like we're going backward it seems like the neighborhood that i lived in then was like the neighborhood should be today but it's, I digress. That's a whole nother interview and conversation. But uh, I was very fortunate. Uh, across the street was a, a lady, a white lady, lived across the street in a fourplex. And uh, I took about three years of classical piano from her. And I really, really enjoyed that. And I did a bunch of recitals. And I don't remember this, but my mom said I would throw up <laughs> before, which is better than throwing up during. And uh, every time you reach a certain level, you would get another bust of the great uh, classical composers, Bach, Chopin, whatever. And uh, I had a whole slew of those. And so that was it. Then in fourth grade, I said, I did three years of that. But in between that, during that period in fourth grade, I got a guitar. I got an acoustic and I learned uh, George Harrison and the Beatles and Ray Charles and what have you. And then we went to a pawn shop and I got an electric guitar and I'm like, ooh, this is it. And in, uh, in fifth grade, I wanted to be in the school band. I was uh, attending uh, Barrett Elementary School in, in Denver. It's about three, four blocks from, from our house. And back in those days, it was a beautiful thing. They, they had loner instruments. Mm. And uh, the kids, I'm sure there's always some everywhere in every era but it seemed like the kids had a little bit more empathy and sympathy for their parents and i was grateful that uh, you know they bought me the two guitars whatever and i was taking piano lessons so i knew they didn't have the money to buy me another instrument and so the day that they gave out the main instruments i was out with a freaking sore throat right so uh the next day when i went the only instrument they had left was a baritone horn and I was like, cool, give it to me. It was brass and uh, with the case was actually almost bigger than I was. But I slept at home every day and I, would, uh, I became second chair and uh, loved it. And it served me so well. And something that I didn't even realize until much later on in life, actually it was when I had been with Earth, Wind & Fire for a few years and had um, done some productions and stuff like that and a young guy back east in dc came up to me and we were talking he said well you know i uh was checking you out and i saw in your history that you played baritone horn and you know and i, I was figuring it out in your arrangements 
they're so beautiful. I, I know that that had a lot to do with it because the baritone horn plays those gorgeous secondary melodies. And I was like, mm -hmm. wow, thank you for telling me who I am. <laughs> and so that was a great thing. I played that throughout high school, junior high, high school, actually elementary, and then all the way on. So anyway, you still there? I'm here. All so right. uh, that gave you maybe some of the uh, coloring um, that you brought to your keyboard arrangements. Absolutely. That and then, you know, being with Earth, Wind & Fire, and of course, Charles Stepney and Maurice was good at that too. Uh, and then, okay, so anyway, then in the sixth grade, <laughs> uh, I got an organ. And boy, that was that was something because uh, my older brother and my younger brother and myself, we had a band called the Big D3. And uh, so we thought that we were going to get gigantic amplifiers because it was just me playing the guitar. I was playing guitar then, electric guitar. And singing, which I can't even fathom that anymore. Uh, and my older brother, who was always, he was like 6'5", but even then I think he was at least six feet. And we made a real ghetto drum set. We had a, a tambourine, old tambourine. We ripped off all the little jingles. And we uh, attached it to uh, like a wire hanger, a hanger from your closet some kind of rig rigged it and stuck it into the bottom half of a music stand that you would use to read it, but we didn't need the top, just the bottom. That was a snare and a cymbal that was about five inches in diameter. It's pathetic. That's about it. And here's this big kid sitting behind that. And my younger brother, Stephen, was hilarious because he would hope he was left-handed. He would hold the, the acoustic guitar that I used to have and kind of just, you know, stand there and chew gum he was so cute now he's turned out to be an incredible composer and arranger and drummer and did most of the drum work on on, on our stuff uh into the journey and uh the larry dunn orchestra stuff at any rate um uh, so we're thinking that we're going to get big amplifiers right so you know uh, christmas eve the kids would always, we'd sneak out into the living room when mom and dad were asleep. At least we hoped they were. And we saw this big this sheet covering just something humongous. And we were like, oh, there's some amplifiers. Well, on Christmas morning, we came out and they unveiled it. And uh, it was a Kimball organ for Larry. Oh, my. <laughs> uh -huh. Thank God, uh, my brother and I, brothers and I are still uh, very much brothers. But I know that was uh, that was something for them, and it was absolutely life changing for me. And I would uh, take my my father's uh, Jimmy Smith and Kenny Burrell records, mm. put them on the turntable, and turn a turntable down from thirty three and a third to sixteen. And uh, yeah, and then I actually got uh, had a band with myself and Hilliard Wilson, Larry Thompson on drums. That were, Hilliard still is with me today. And I saw Larry when we just got back, when we got to Denver for the, they inducted me, Andrew Wolfolk and Philip Bailey in the Colorado Music Hall of Fame on uh, November 28th. So I got to see Larry and, uh, and I was talking to Hilliard at NAMM the other day. Our dream is to do something together again. At any rate, I was 11 years old mm. and Hilliard and Larry were 13. And we had a great, basically instrumental band we had a, a tenor sax alto sax me on organ hugh on bass larry Thompson on drums and a guitar player i can't remember what he his name was and we were doing stuff like hugh masticala grazing the grass and jimmy smith the cat and stuff like that and then two years later we went to a place where the young kids got to go and play and hear music and we saw another band and had a three young guys sitting on stools and they were singing. Uh, I'm pretty sure I remember it was uh, Curtis Mayfield in the shadows. In the shadows. And we'll get to that certain part to break up to beautiful three part harmony. And one of those singers was Philip Bailey. Philip Bailey, Carl Carwell, and Winston, I can't remember his last name. I know, Julius Carey, actually. And so we snatched them up with us. 
And uh, so we, we were doing everything from James Brown to the Temptations, the moments, the stylistics. Uh, and then as time went on, Santana, I mean, on and on and on. The what moment. what what was the quality of Philip singing at that point? Oh, Philip was always, you know, he was always Philip. Way back then, I remember a young lady that we used to go to school with, and she was talking to me one time. She said, oh, you guys are just so... You guys are so good, and and Philip's Philip Philip's voice is just—it's like an angel, so beautiful. So, hey, man, you know. Uh, and then uh, eventually, uh, we were doing Battle of the Bands, and ironically enough, when we did the uh, when we got inducted, Philip and I were there uh, in Denver in, in November, and it was at this Paramount Theater downtown, which is the same theater that we won a couple of the Battle of the Band. Uh, things that that's pretty cool it was and so by the time i was 15 you know my little italian mom pops had split when i was about 13 and uh we you know so we were playing seven nights a week in this 21 and over nightclub i'm 15 years old hmm. and uh groups like like the whispers and young hope trio and bobby lyle and uh, certain artists would come through there and they were like who are these little boys but the level, you know, we were like little kids, but we were playing on an adult level for sure. Uh, we would rehearse during the day, there, you know, if we weren't in school, uh, and even a after school, you know, we'd rehearse before playing that night. And you know, very, I, I used to love it. They had a B three organ there because by that time, my little Kimball organ had about thirteen keys broken off of it because Harriet's mother. Uh, on the janitorial service and, and here it would work his little butt off with her and if he was good and worked enough then she would let him use the van to cart around our equipment and the organ would tilt and pop a key here and pop a key there and so just in perfect timing when we started playing at the club they had a b3 and i was beside myself so larry just to set the uh time frame this is like late 60s absolutely yeah. And what was the music scene like overall in that part of the country, would you say, you know, during that era? Oh, yeah, well, it was great. And like I said, plus I had, you know, my father's jazz collection uh, and and her, him and my mother, you know, like I said, back then, I, I don't really, at least with us, there, there wasn't really a, uh, a generation gap. Um. We all knew good music. Like I said, here I am, 12, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, whatever, listening to Jimmy Smith, Kenny Burrell, uh, Milt Jackson, on and on and on. Uh, and uh, my mother's uh, Frank Sinatra records. Uh, actually, it was her and my dad. And then also, my mom had 78's Italian Tarantella. Mm -hmm. And then... Uh, we didn't have a lot of jazz stuff, but we did have some stations. Um, but so, for example, I knew about Ramsey Lewis and certain artists. I personally didn't really find out that much about like Herbie. I knew a little bit about Herbie. Yeah, I knew Herbie, but I didn't know about McCoy Tyner and Wynton Kelly and um, what's the other great? I got the whole box set. Starts with an A, jazz pianist. No, <laughs> nothing. Um, anyway, I digress. Um, and then um, Santana came out and we were playing everything. Like I said, the Rolling Stones, just all different types of music. And then the the Jimi Hendrix and the, you know, Cream, uh, 10 years after all that different stuff. We went to a concert up in uh, Red Rocks, in Colorado. I think that's the first time I ever had a headache <laughs> because the music was so freaking loud, and we loved, we liked it, we loved it. But even even outdoors, wow. Oh yeah, you know, the beautiful Red Rocks up in the mountains. It's a beautiful place. Um, and so yeah, that was just awesome. And then we went to the first rock festival at the stadium. And we all knew about the groups, and it was, uh, like I said, 10 years after, again, Cream, the main ones. And then they, the headliner was Jimi Hendrix. 
So you saw Hendrix. I, I, so I got two stories on that. So he was getting ready to come on, and they, way across the football field, you could see him walking out with the other two guys, and he had his, the headband on and a guitar, and like, oh, yeah. But, you know, I would never forget when I first walked into that um, stadium, hearing that style of rock guitar and stuff, it was like I was in a different universe. Because we're used to playing jazz and R&B and pop and the Beatles and that kind of stuff. And so when that happened with the Hendrix style stuff and the rock guitars and all that, it was like I was on a different planet. But we liked it. We loved it. And uh, so, yeah, it, it was it was just awesome. You know, we were just little kids, basically. And then the same band went, was me and here you'd fill up. Larry, all the guys, Carl. We went to a house in Denver during the daytime. It was a big, you know, outside party. And we had a band. The band was there. We are playing. And then Jimmy freaking Hendrix shows up. At, at the house? He puts his guitar case down. And he opens it up. And he takes out his guitar. And he's walking up there, getting ready. We're going to sit in with freaking Jimi Hendrix. And some disgruntled, miserable son of a gun had called the police. That's right. Shake your head some more, Scotty. <laughs> wow. And so the police came. And uh, game over. He very quietly put his guitar in the case, closed it, and walked away. Oh, Jimmy. He really, people? He stayed in New York or England. Huh? <laughs> he was probably thinking he shouldn't have left England or New York. For real. But yeah, that was, you know, you talk about heart wrenching. Really? Put that on your resume. That's like played with Jimi Hendrix. I don't care if it was eight bars. Played with Jimi Hendrix. Yeah. So, but yeah, but you know, so all that was going on. You know, that was like what, maybe 67, 68. And I believe it was 69. The genius uh historians like yourself probably know. Marvin Gaye, what's going on? Yep. My mind. At this point, we had a band named Friends and Love. It was uh, a bunch of us cats from Denver, and then we had two white guys from Philadelphia. Steve Sykes, Funky Boy. He was, I, th I touched it to you. I said, that's why they wrote that song later, played that funky music, White Boy. And him and I are still buddies. Uh, he is a great engineer. I did uh, some production, a group called Real Tight, and uh, Luis and I actually... Uh, had called him and he did the mix for us and with us and but he was back to playing guitar as well and then there was a uh, the sax player both of them were guys two guys from Philly Greg something and he he was doing the the, random, the record thing way back then and we used to play at this place in Colorado up in the mountains called the Hornbook out in Boulder Colorado the Hornbook Inn turn it out. And it's amazing because, you know, people were smoking marijuana and drinking and everything. They had them little bar tables. And at the end of the night, people would be standing on top of them, yet nobody fell and cracked their head. Hmm. <laughs> it was it was the divine order or something. And uh, so that, that was very deep. But let me go back a little bit. One thing that was very important. When I was 13 years old, my my uh, uncle on the Italian, my mom's side, my Italian uncle, was the uh, janitor for the Denver Arena downtown Denver, Colorado. And lo and behold, he got me into my first big concert at 13. It was James Brown. Okay? Wow. James Brown. And hey, I've been playing his music since I was 11. And uh, man, it was just, it just, you know, I was just blown away. And I said, you know what? I'm going to be on that stage one day. And it almost happened, except it did happen, but it didn't happen because they tore that place down. 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, but six, uh, five years later, I was on that stage. It was the Coliseum of nice. 18,000 people in Denver. Uh, but I remember, man, they, you know, 
James to see James Brown dance is one thing. To see him live is another. But the first time I had ever seen a strobe light, and they had not one, they had two, and they were industrial. And they turned those things on and turned the lights off, and it looked like he was just floating across the stage. I'm like, oh my God, home alone. <laughs> um, and then and when it was over, everybody exited, and my uncle had to clean up, and there was nobody in there. Me, my uncle, and again, you might know the the saxophone, the baritone sax player. Tall guy had the little gray streak right in the middle of his head. And I said, okay, I'm going. I went down there and I said, hi, I'm Larry Dunn. I play organ. I would love to play with you guys. And he looked at me and said, you know, kid, I bet you could really play. And he did the epilogue with this. And you know, if it wasn't for the fact that James thinks he could play the organ, we might've been able to do something. And I was like, whatever, I'm going to keep it moving. You will see me again. And uh, so, yeah, that was life changing. Wow. That's awesome. My my first concert was um, the Eagles, my sister. Not quite as funky. <laughs> what year was that? Uh, 72. 70 what? 72. 72. That was my second year out in Los Angeles to be with Earth, Wind, and Fire. All right. So amazing how, experiences. How, how did I get in Earth, Wind, and Fire? Is that the one? Yeah. Somehow, one way or another, Maurice White saw you guys. <laughs> All right. So we were always abreast of stuff. And I think we even did one or two of the songs. We were familiar with the first go around of Earth, Wind, and Fire. And for those who don't know, Maurice was actually a session drummer and jazz drummer, then became jazz drummer for uh, Ramsey Lewis, and Ramsey Lewis Trio. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but him, Charles Stepney, and uh, I would imagine Tom Tom, I don't know. Maybe Tom Tom hadn't come along yet, but whatever, Charles Stepney, and Louis Satterfield, Maurice, they were all doing those great sessions at Chess Records in Chicago, with the Dells and Rotary Connection, Ramsey, all that. Uh, so anyway, uh, Earth, Wind & Fire came to Denver. And we had a, um, a conduit, Perry Jones, who actually claimed the fame as uh, discovering me and Philip and Prince. And he was a real, real I feel we saw Perry in, uh, in uh, November when we were there. Um, he was an A&R guy for Warner Brothers. So that's how he knew Maurice. And so it all kind of got interconnected. But anyway, so Earth on a Fire with Maurice and the older guys and Sherry Scott was doing a performance in Denver, Colorado at the Hilton Hotel. It was an afternoon gig. And so our band, Friends in Love, opened the show for them. And uh, so, of course, Perry was very close with them because Warner Brothers knew uh, so that evening, after the gig was done there at the Hilton, Maurice and Verdine came down to the little nightclub we were playing at. And a little round stage that would just go around in a circle and I had to be three in the guys. So that's how we made that connection. About a year later, if that, they broke up, we broke up, and then Philip came out to Los Angeles and became musical director for a gospel group called the Stovall Sisters. Mm -hmm. And they were, Maurice in the meantime was going in through many, many different musicians and keyboard players and whatever, everything. Uh, Philip came back to Denver. And at this point I was playing with another bar band, Sammy Mayfield, young guy whose mom had passed when he was 12 years old. And he's still around blues playing mother figure and singer. And but I told him the same thing. I said, look, the only way I'll be in your band is we got to rehearse. Always the R word. He's like, cool. And we did. So anyway, Phil came back to Denver just to hang out. You know, his wife went to Manual High School. Me and Philip went to East. So the group War was performing again. I don't know what this is. In the afternoon at Manual High School. 
So Philip was in the audience. So and, and so we, me, Sammy Mayfield band, we opened for them. So I took like a 10 minute Hammond B3 organ solo and just wiped it out. And Philip went to the phone. There was no cell phones there unless you were with the FBI. And he uh, put in a whole bunch of money and he called Maurice in Los Angeles and said, hey, I think we might have the guy, man. You know, he can really play, you know, and he's a nice guy, you know. Doesn't have a lot of experience later on in life. They don't ever, don't you ever tell anybody no crap like that. I was playing nightclubs when I was still smelling like Similac behind my ears. Uh, remind me to tell you about that, the Big D3, when we won the uh, talent show at the casino ballroom on the five points. So anyway, uh, Maurice was like, cool. So Maurice flew me out. In that me in meantime, I acquired uh, a 73 key stage model Fender Rose, the one with the legs, not the suitcase model. But some Hispanic brothers that had one and they said they would sell it. I went over and said, oh, it was hot. No. <laughs> It's hot. They wanted, I think, seventy-five or a hundred dollars. I'm like, hey, I got twenty-five dollars. Okay. Wow. <laughs> so I jokingly say, if they ever saw me again in life, and remember, they go, "Hey, Bato, you know, we're proud of you, man." But we want 40, 52 years of interest. <laughs> but yeah, that was deep. So anyway, I learned because you know I spoke with Maurice and stuff. So I had a couple three weeks. So I'm a little apartment. So I learned all of Earth, Wind & Fire's first two albums on Warner Brothers by ear. And I flew out. Verdeen picked me up. Almost got both of us killed going up what I know now to be Century Boulevard. Had a piano in the back and had this green van, dark green van. And he's going over to get in the turning lane. I'm like, okay. Then he keeps going over one lane and he's going in oncoming, oncoming traffic, head on. And very much Magooish, he's cussing them out. And I'm like, Verdine, Verdine, you're in the wrong lane. Anyway, through the grace of God, we made it up to him and Maurice's house. And we whipped out the piano. It was just Maurice and Verdine. And so Verdine whipped out his bass, and Maurice was just sitting there and went over some of the earth with her fire stuff. And then I said, let me show him. I can go places. So I went into a little bit of Herbie Hancock Maiden Voyage. Mm -hmm. And uh, the rest, as they say, was history. Wow. So, Larry, what were your first impressions of both Maurice and Verdine? Well, like I said, I, I had the uh, good blessing to meet them in Denver. And like I said, we already knew their music. And I was just in awe, you know, but Verdine, because we I had dinner a couple of weeks ago with my wife and I and Verdine and uh, Ray Parker and his wife and then Verdine, our buddy that we did uh, some recording with DJ Cassidy, young guy, and his girlfriend, uh, Verdine's wife had to stay home because her mother was staying there. But uh, anyway, Verdine, we always tell the story. He was telling the young kid, DJ Cassidy, that when Verdine and I first met each other, we both looked at each other. And we didn't say it out loud, just to ourselves. We went, Damn, he's skinny. <laughs> and DJ Cassidy looked at Verdine said, it has never changed. But, uh, you know, and I just, I was in awe. And I loved uh, immediately Verdine's bass playing and uh, the whole thing. Now, Maurice wasn't that great of a vocalist on those first two albums. But what I did love is that I could hear the, the evolution starting, you know, because most records that you heard up until Earth, Wind & Fire, and especially when they, when we got deeper into it, the drums, you know, in Motown, the drums were great, but the drums were just a beat. It was just a rhythm. It wasn't until after the Maurice was a drummer, and then especially, you know, with uh, Massenburg and all that, where the freaking uh, bass drum hits you in the chest and the, you know, in the bass and, you know, that real punch, it was a different type of wall of sound. I know we had, what's the guy? 
that so-called invented the, the Phil Spector. Uh, right. Uh, that was one, but Earth, Wind, and Fire. There was a different wall of sound because that the, the kick drum and then the, you know with those high mids on it, and, but the low end was just an awesome thing. And then to, so you know to be able to work with them was a great thing. And then start. I mean, I had written a little bit in Colorado, but nothing like after you know I started doing out out here. So what a huge change for you. I think you were, what were you, 19? Pardon me? What Were you 19 years old? I was 15 when I met Maurice, or 16. And you, I was 17. Actually, I had just turned 18 when I flew out here to, to join the band. So and then you also started living in L.A. as well? Never to return again, but to Denver. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, what a just incredible change, you know, 18 and then this huge up and coming band. I mean, right. You must, you were living the life, man. Well, I mean, but you know, the thing was like, I tell people today and it doesn't matter old, young alike. So, so many people want to choose a vocation predicated. Oh, let me see. Oh, doctors make a lot of money. Or, you know, ooh, an attorney. But I always tell people, I said, look, first of all, do something that you enjoy doing. And of course, if it's something that can help others, ooh, even better. But m most jobs are helping others. Um, absolutely. Uh, but the thing was, people would say to me, well, that must have really, you know, been or this or this. I said, no, not really, because I kind of always knew since I was a kid. Because we weren't kidding. You know, like I said, now a lot of people, you know, why do you want to, I want to be famous. What the fudge? Mm -hmm. You know, I saw some stupid guy, God bless him, but he was stupid. This guy was in his 50s or something. And, you know, and, and, and I don't, his, his girlfriend, 15 years or something or 11, never married her. And, and he's up there like, you know, I want to be an actor. All of a sudden, you want to be an actor. And I know it's going to happen. I'm trying to get my famous on. Uh, and that's the problem. You know, people want fame, but they don't even understand there's certain stuff that comes along with that. And like I said, I think because I was prepared, I never tripped. I mean, I remember being 19 years old and, and people, young brothers down south would come up to me and, oh, lad, duh, man, man, you the baddest keyboard player in the world. You're my idol. I said, stop. I'm 19. I said, stop. First of all, no man should be another man's idol. God is God is God. And God creates everybody. Whatever it is you see in me that's tickling your fancy, you have the same thing. You just have to work on it. I said, but there's things in me that you don't see that ain't so cool that I have to work on. Right. And as far as being the baddest keyboard player in the world, eh, again, no such thing. Damn, I remember saying that when I was nine. I said, like, I forgot what I used. I said, for for somebody, uh, Glenn Campbell's keyboard player may be the baddest keyboard or the best keyboard player in the world. So, you know, these are blurred lines there. And, you know, most, a lot of them did get it. Some of them had that look like, okay, gotta go. But yeah, uh, well, best that, is that, totally that, subjective. Right, absolutely. But uh, I always tell people the story. We were rehearsing out at the Warner Brothers lot. And I guess they had just shot a Pepsi Dent commercial. And they had these huge freaking teeth, man. And it was a whole set of teeth that was probably, I'm, I'm not exaggerating, probably at least six to eight feet high. Not 68, six to eight. In some way, kind of, you know, goofy me. I got on top of them walking around. And I just remember when I was walking around up there, that we had just finished rehearsing or whatever. And I was like, this is going to be really big. And of course, at 18 years old, you compared to what? You know, now, of course, I mean, I'm, I'm not that stupid to say, oh, God, I knew that. I mean, there's no way that nobody knew that the music would still be living on. Here we are 50 years later. Yeah, what an amazing ride. So that is, you know. What, when, you, um, when you got with them and you were starting to, you know, coalesce, 
what mostly did you do first? Were you mostly rehearsing? Did you uh, do any live gigs? Did you go right into the studio? What happened? Excellent questions. I have no answer. No. Uh, actually, it was, it was pretty deep. Uh, Maurice had a vision, and God dang it, he was going to stick to it. And rightfully so. He had this thing that, you know, if we if we start taking these little gigs at Osco's or these little clubs around uh, around L.A. I remember Osco's. Right? Yeah. Osco's. Disco, yeah. Yeah, and and, and a couple other ones. He's like, that's going to kind of, you know, mess up the uh, mystique. He always had them with good about mystique. And he said, uh, plus, now this is funny, just because of the time, the same people that, that would pay five or two dollars or three three fifty or something five dollars to see you at Oscos, they ain't gonna pay fifteen dollars to see you at the forum. Wow, fifteen dollars. Actually, I've seen some of those pictures in the Earth and Fire Legacy page with the ticket, you know. Earth, Wind, and Fire, live in concert, ten dollars, yeah, nine dollars, right? But so what we did is uh, Philip and I uh, had a, a, a little apartment that we lived in together, and we would. Uh, he started studying percussion with a guy. God, what was his name? It was a short nickname, Todd, or something like that. I don't remember. And he would. You know, he's just learning the tones. Uh, really, because you know, a lot of people just beat on. Oh, I, I'm a kunga player. No, you're not. You know how to draw those tones out and different stuff. And he also had a little raggedy. I'm gonna get these raggedy pianos. A little raggedy Wolitzer. And I would listen to McCoy Tyner and different stuff. I said, I'm gonna get this stuff. And we would basically just, re you know, practice every day. And then Maurice gave us enough dough. I remember one time we were pretty, pretty, pretty hungry. So we had. One, not, not, they didn't have that super crap. Just a regular little old can of Campbell's chili soup, they call it, but it was chili. And so we split it in half. And I was taking Phillips' leave. He we put it exactly in half. And then he took some cheese and sprinkled it on it, cheddar cheese. So I did the same. Then he put a bunch of crackers on it. And then topped it off with some ketchup and mixed it all together. We were happy as two pigs and you know what. And uh, and it's okay, we'd do that. And then uh, if we weren't doing that, then we would be having rehearsals with Earth, Wind, and Fire. Rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. And uh, you know that's what I tell people. I said, look, man, you take away Clive Davis and the record deal. You take away phase on in the choreography. You take away Doug Henning and Copperfield and the magic tricks. You take away Bill Whitten and the wonderful outfits and, and all this stuff and the lighting and the sound and the deal is no secret. We rehearsed our butts off. Okay? And it was none of the, hey man, I gotta get out of here, bye. And uh, you know, now that I've got the Larry Dunn Orchestra and you know, in the past I've I've had a couple of younger brothers and I had to get on them because, you know, uh, we were rehearsing at this church where my good pastor buddy lets us rehearse. And I look out and where the, you know, into we're on the stage. I look out there and I see this young guy, great talent. And he's on the phone. Man, I'm over here rehearsing with Larry Dunn. I got right on. I said, no, you're not. You're supposed to, but you're not rehearsing with me, you're on the phone. And I told him, I said, look, man, maybe that's why there's not a lot of great bands anymore. Because there's so many freaking distractions. I said, we didn't have no damn phones, really? I said, I don't even think we had a watch. Mm -hmm. It was about the freaking music. Definitely too many distractions today. Oh my God, you know, everybody, this is, our, this is the whole life, is this. You know, and like I said, technology, everything has a purpose. There you go. Yeah, so because uh, uh, no expense spared on graphics here, there's uh, the former Earth, Wind & Fire and then the Larry Dunn era 
Earth, Wind, and Fire. Hey. <laughs> wow. What book? What, what, what is that Maurice's book? Yeah. 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 Uh, I have that. Yeah. Yeah, that was a, a great. And that's, uh, that's you right next to uh, Maurice there. Yes, sir. Yep. Well, with the, still with the big head and the big hair. <laughs> Actually, my wife just cut my hair. She said it was getting too long. I'm like, whatever. <laughs> I but need yeah, to man, see it was, myself. It was a, a wild ride. And uh, let me let me digress and go back to one thing that I skipped over when I said my me and my two brothers had the big D3. And we had these black shirts, turtlenecks. And it was black, red, and white. Right and here, the rest was black. And and it was at the casino ballroom. There was a, there's a there was an area. It's gentrification, but there was an area in Denver called the Five Points. It was uberly famous, and it was called the Five Points because there was a one section there where actually five corners met. Usually, it's always four corners, but there was five corners. They named it the Five Points. And they had such clubs as the Rossonian, the um, the Casino Ballroom, which is, uh, they had a talent show down there. So the Big D3 were one of the co competitors. And so my mom was there, my dad was there, uh, and us. And we won third place. And that's when I was playing, see the girl with the red dress on. To this day, like I said, I just can't believe that I was singing. Nowadays, I mean, I can sing very well enough to yell at singers and tell them what I want them to sing. Was that before your as, voice as, changed? As a producer. But uh, so I was like, wow, really? I get to stay up. Let me get this right. I get to stay up late with the adults. I get to do music. Wow. We won third place. We got a picture in the newspaper. And I got $12. Wow. Remember Steve Martin in a jerk? Yeah. I heard my first Montavani record. And I said to myself, these are my people. This is my music. Oh, yeah. That that was another uh, tentpole or milestone or life-changing event. Because I was like, really? I would do this for free. Of course, that's what all musicians say. I would do this for free. But to be able to, and then, like I said, and stay up with the adults late. Because I was like, yeah, that, this is what I'm going to do.